I decided to do this video now for two reasons. First, having just seen that a Norton Commando sold for $20,000 on Bring a Trailer, that's a significant increase in value even just over the past two years. But more importantly, I want to introduce you guys to our puppy that we've had for a few months now, whose name happens to be Norton. When we got him, my wife asked me if there were any good names for motorcycle history that would fit with a Great Dane, and I said, well, it's either Norton or Bruff Superior. I mean, Vincent probably would have worked, or Massimo Tom. Anyways, hopefully you guys can see him more in videos to come if we do more in-person videos. Also, I want to give a big thanks again to Mike from The Mighty Garage for allowing me to use so much of his Commando footage. You guys can check out his channel link below in the description if you're interested in Norton Commandos or really loads of other British bikes. He's got a bunch of cool bikes. I think he has like four Norton Commandos. I'll also link a few of my favorite videos by him for you guys to check out. So go subscribe to him, show him some love. Anyways, let's jump in and learn about this iconic motorcycle, the Norton Commando, arguably the last British roadster. Much like Norton's recent and current motorcycle endeavors, the Norton Commando rose from the ashes of a defunct company. Some motorcycles are born out of passion and often excess. You know, you've got companies like Honda able to just do crazy things at certain points in their history because they're so successful. The Commando was different though. This motorcycle came out of need, a sort of dire, last-ditch effort to save a dying company, or in this case, a sort of dying conglomerate, and survive the next decade. The writing was on the wall for the British motorcycle companies going into the mid-60s. Japanese sport bikes were well on their way to outperforming anything the British had to offer, plus companies like Norton and BSA and Triumph were all about 10 years behind when it came to technology and features. Leaky, unreliable, ever more uncomfortable, kickstart-only motorcycles were no longer the norm, riders could get better, easier to maintain cheaper, and soon faster motorcycles for less money. Moving into the late 60s, there would appear a few last-ditch efforts from the British companies, mainly the triples utilized by Triumph and BSA, which was the Trident and the Rocket 3, and then the bikes we're looking at today, the Norton Commando. And it's that motorcycle, though, that really sticks out from this time as the last great British motorcycle of this era. In spite of oncoming competition threatening to kill Norton and its fellow British companies, companies like Norton still had one big advantage over the ever-improving Japanese bikes, which is handling. And in some ways, that's sort of synonymous with frame design. Norton knew that they needed to up the ante with this bike without losing the thing that attracted riders to British bikes in the first place. So with the goal of a 750cc powerful sport bike with reduced vibration and increased features and reliability, that was the target for all of the major manufacturers heading into the late 60s, and Norton gave themselves one year to build it in hopes of having something to unveil at the 1967 Earl's Court Motorcycle Show. The project was headed up by Norton Villiers' new director of engineering. Engineering, Dr. Stefan Bauer, and it all started for him by just going on a few rides on the back of some of Norton's current big twins, and he found himself shocked by the vibrations he felt, and so he set out to develop a motorcycle that could successfully basically isolate the rider from all those vibrations. Bauer himself, having just came over from Rolls-Royce, obviously a company known for making comfortable vehicles, he found that Norton's motorcycles at the time just weren't comfortable enough. So as the Japanese and other British companies sought to build engines with more cylinders as a way to decrease vibration, Norton took a different route. A newly designed frame utilizing a rear swing arm along with a large diameter top tube and most importantly, a new isoclastic rubber mounting system. This system would make the Norton Commando the smoothest big British twin to date. Handling was maintained for the bike by limiting the engine's movement to a vertical plane, keeping the wheels nicely in line with the frame and keeping the overall feel nice and tight like Norton's other bikes leading up to this point. Now this rubber mounting system actually harkens back to another less known British motorcycle, the Sunbeam S7 and S8 from the late 40s and the early 1950s. And I've had a bit of experience with this motorcycle as I owned a Project Sunbeam S8 while living in Hawaii, and despite failing to get it running, it was way too big of a project for me, I did manage to put the whole thing sort of together into a rolling motorcycle. And so I got to see how that rubber mounting system worked, essentially. Though, of course, the commando system was much more advanced. Also, that Sunbeam had what I guess you would call like an inline 
twin, whereas this was a parallel twin. Now at this point, Norton's main competitive sporting engine was the 750cc unit Atlas motor, developed as a successor to the 500cc Dominator engine. In spite of first utilizing the recent P10 engine for this project, the group was forced to turn back to the trusty Atlas engine platform due to ongoing issues of production for the P10 and a lack of power and excessive vibrations, the P10 engine was just not working for this project. This change to the Atlas engine happened just weeks before the first unveil of the Commando was set to take place, but that first prototype was completed in time, featuring not only this new innovative frame and also some more modern features, but also a shocking new design. Now the first prototype of the Commando looked very little like the British bikes of its day. A bright orange, oddly shaped seat coupled with a sort of matte, space age silver color, and also a silver painted frame. The bike really stood out and in many ways this was what was needed for the British motorcycle industry. Over the years the Norton Commando would take on a more classic but sort of stylish British roadster look while maintaining those unique features from the prototype, but much of what this bike initially looked like would soon change. The prototype for the Commando was first unveiled at the Earls Court Motorcycle Show in 1967, one year before its production release. This was, for all intents and purposes, an entirely new British motorcycle, the first of its kind in a very long time. The British companies had not made a new bike in quite a while. Though the actual product itself is still most important when it comes to sales, there's no doubt that marketing is key. The British companies had not figured this out yet. With the Commando, Norton did what hadn't been done before from a British motorcycle manufacturer and maybe any automotive manufacturer in general, which is they practiced branding. Though the concept of branding as we know it today didn't really exist in the late 60s, what Norton did with this motorcycle was essentially branding. This bike was meant to stand out with the bright orange seat and originally the concept was that the bike would stay essentially the same among models and only the seat color would change. This is something that was utilized by manufacturers later on down the road as the Commando didn't end up sticking to this sort of model. But oddly enough the marketing company tasked with building up sales material for the bike utilized something known as the green dot. I mean it's pretty simple to see why people called it that. It's literally a green dot. This was essentially an identifying mark for the bike like on sales brochures it would just sort of exist by the text but even at things like events for the Norton Commando there would be things like green balloons set up the prototype for the Norton Commando would utilize this at various points like on the gauges initially the marketing agency pushed for Norton to have zero official Norton branding on the bike and they wanted that green dot to just be on the tank with nothing else but the higher-ups at Norton were not okay with this. They thought that it would be awkward, so they forced it so that Norton Villiers would be in the green dot. And I think they should have listened to the agency. This bike was so well marketed for this time, these people knew what they were talking about and what they were doing. At one point, the company suggested that Norton sell motorcycle gloves with the green dot on them, and Norton refused to do this. You know, they made motorcycles, not clothes, was how they responded, which is pretty funny in light of today. Every major motorcycle manufacturer sells apparel and equipment and gear. To no surprise, the motorcycle was a bit of a sensation at the time. Everyone was covering it because it was so fresh for a British company to be producing a bike this bold and this different. And in this way, as it turns out, a motorcycle that was really innovative. It wasn't just sold in an innovative way and it didn't just look different. They did fix quite a few of the faults present among the big, fast British twins of this time. Now, the Commando was first available in the spring of 1968. And yes, if you're wondering the timing of its release, in comparison to other important motorcycles of this time. Triumph's Trident didn't reach the public until a few months after this. Honda's CB750 didn't get unveiled until later that year, and Kawasaki's Mach 3 didn't reach the United States until 1969. So in many ways, the Commando, having been revealed in 67 and then available in 68, beat quite a few of the other big innovative bikes to the punch despite still lacking in many areas, at least in comparison to the Japanese competition that would show up at the end of the decade. In terms of design, the production version didn't really stray from the original concept as far as many bikes do. The overall lines and shapes were the same, but the color concept was different. The rather unique seat shape and what we could call sort of a fastback setup remained the same, though the orange seat and silver frame and tank were replaced with more conventional black frames and bright but 
but still conventional tank colors. Now, in many ways, this was the first motorcycle to exist as more of a platform. A lot of people don't like when I use that phrase. I've seen comments that complain about it. They're like, well, it's just a motorcycle. Why are you calling it a platform? But really, it's just a way of explaining that there aren't simply motorcycles anymore. There are existing platforms, you know, a frame and an engine. And on those platforms, we get other different motorcycles. You know, you can't say that a Yamaha R7 and an MT-07 aren't different motorcycles or a Tenere 7. They are all different motorcycles, but they're all existing on the same platform. Anyways, that's why people use that phrase. And in a lot of ways, the Norton Commando utilized the same thing. In contrast to the norm, especially out of Great Britain, Norton focused on the Commando range as a platform that that could easily be customized for different niches. One could have a commando set up for touring and purchase it that way directly from the manufacturer. And on the same bike, one could choose something with a smaller fuel tank and a different seat and exhaust and handlebars. Companies like Triumph and BSA just weren't really doing this. Sure, they would offer a high pipe model or a single car model, but Norton used their commando to create a full model lineup that really did appear diverse, and this simplified production to the point where commandos were essentially the only bike that they produced in those final years. And some may see this as a problem, but for Norton, it really did keep them alive. They would not have been able to survive as long as they did if they hadn't gone down this route. Now, in terms of the evolution and development of the Norton Commando after it was released, the bike really didn't come into its own, at least for me personally, or what a lot of us sort of know of as the commando style until 1970 when the Roadster was released. This model had a slimmer, smaller, arguably more proportional gas tank that definitely held less fuel. The same 750cc Atlas engine, though it would be bumped up to a bigger 828cc capacity starting in 73, but perhaps the trademark of this model was the upswept exhaust. It's tough to argue that there's a more iconic exhaust than Triumph's pea shooters of this era, but the Commando is right there with the look and sound. It's just an incredible exhaust system. With the Roadster, it really marked for the Commando a return to what we would call a more British styling. You know, the smaller tank, the more traditional seat, much like the Triumphs and BSAs of this time. So with this iteration, the bike had all the good of a more advanced, comfortable motorcycle, especially due to that lack of vibration found normally on the big twins, but it now looked like a awesome British motorcycle. But the styling was still so unique, it still didn't really look that much like a BSA or Triumph. The Roadster tank was slim, but more square and angular, whereas the Triumphs and BSAs had round, curving tanks. I've talked about this. Triumph spikes at this time, they were all curves, and so were the BSAs. But the Roadster tank was a little bit angular, almost in the way that the Japanese bikes would be, but it sort of, I don't know, it felt somewhere in between the angularness of a Japanese bike and the curvy, round sort of shape that the British bikes had this time and it just looked awesome. In terms of performance, the Commando was definitely one of the fastest motorcycles that you could buy, and perhaps the fastest, depending on what your meter for overall speed and performance was. Many did clock the Norton Commando as faster in a straight line than a CB750. It was reported to have better quarter mile times, and most say that it handled better, though of course it had worse braking capability. It was upgraded to disc brakes later on, but I love this quote found on one of the Honda forums on this topic. This guy says that years ago at Westwood Racetrack on the outskirts of Vancouver, BC, the production racing class was ruled by the CB750, Triumph Trident, and Norton Commando. No bike had a clear dominance. It seemed the winner was the one who had the fewest beers the night before. <laughs> So these three major bikes in the late 60s and early 70s all sort of fought for dominance and for, you know, which was the fastest and most performance oriented. The Commando 750 produced 56 horsepower and the 850 later produced 60, still quite a bit less than the CB750 which produced about 67 horsepower 
when it first came out, but less weight, probably better handling, all the goods of a British sport bike from this time sort of made the Commando a winner in many riders' books. The Norton Commando was named Machine of the Year by Motorcycle News five years in a row from 1968 through 1972. Though the Norton Commando didn't go far enough to ultimately save the company and save the British motorcycle industry, this bike still had so many of the faults present in the other big British twins, remedied by the sport bike offerings of the Japanese competition. It still utilized the Prince of Darkness Lucas Electrics, the same culprit for why British people like warm beer. Their refrigerators were powered by Lucas Electrics. The Commando still leaked oil all over the place due to outdated engine case design. No electric start until 1975, a full decade after Honda had been putting electric starts on their big twins. Oh, and that electric start, it didn't work great. It was pretty bad. Just a four-speed gearbox. I mean, the list goes on and on. And in many ways, these faults are a testament to how good this bike was. As Triumph had ended its heyday at the turn of the decade going into the 70s, and the same is true for BSA, this bike carried Norton along and really symbolized the pinnacle of their success for production motorcycles at a time when all of the other British companies were basically dying. It was still good, still winning bike of the year, and still a great option for many riders well into the 70s in spite of the incredible innovation that came out of Japan. One of the biggest changes that made the Commando what it was is the styling. The British companies were so unwilling to change their styling. The Commando was a bike that was thoroughly different in style, but it still managed to keep its identity as a British roadster, while looking so different than the other British bikes that had existed for the last 10 years. We talked about how the tank was slightly different, but still tasteful, but for the iconic roadster that so many people find desirable, the color was key. There hadn't been an all-black British sporting motorcycle in a very long time, though the Thunderbird wasn't, I guess, that far back from the Commando. This style, though, harkens back to other British motorcycle manufacturers, the Sunbeams and AJSs, bikes of the pre-war era, true sporting machines that had more of a square tank, as was common then, and the gold lines with the gold written name on the tank. I'm not sure this has been proposed, but I really do think that the black and gold Norton Commando Roadsters were modeled after bikes like the Sunbeam Model 9 of the late 20s. The styling was something so different, but when you really look into the history, it feels like it's still really maintaining the tradition. But I think the biggest thing that helped the Commando survive for so long was the performance. Not necessarily the speed, but more the smooth nature of it for a rider. I mean, people flocked to the four-cylinder CBs over the British offerings because they were so smooth, so easy to ride for long periods of time, and if the Commando could have kept up with reliability and ease of use, it would have lasted because it had something those bikes lacked. It maintained that British twin character, but without all of the fuss and troubles, it was still unreliable and leaked oil and all that stuff, but it rode so much smoother. And if you're going to ride an old British bike and you want to put down some serious miles, the Norton Commando is probably your best bet. Sure, the Commando technically didn't go far enough, but the little changes that were made were enough to make it an icon right up there with bikes like the Bonneville and the Gold Star and, you know, the CB750. But unlike the other British bikes, it could actually hang and hang on longer in the face of the Japanese bikes. It's really the small stuff that sets this bike apart and that should be a lesson for manufacturers struggling today to figure out how to navigate what motorcycling is for new generations. When you look at the Norton Commando and its legacy and now growing popularity as a collector's bike, and just the way that it stands out among other British bikes and bikes in general from this time, I think that the lesson is that subtle differences can often make all the difference. 